Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining one of our learning science series sessions. This is called Accessibility 101, Library and ARC, or the Accessibility Resource Center, support for faculty and students. I am so pleased to have Kathy Meals, Assessment Librarian, Trisha Clark, Community College Engagement Librarian, and Robert Vela, Rehabilitation Counselor at the Accessibility Resource Center. I'm also joined by my lovely colleague, Dominique Laws, and thank you again for joining us today. So our, really our goal for this session is faculty will learn more about incorporating accessibility standards into their courses and about the accessibility resources offered here at UDC. We are here also to answer any questions that you may have. So feel free to put those in the chat box or unmute if you would like. Just a brief overview of the Zoom controls on your screen. You'll see that toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to unmute or turn on your camera if you would like. You can also use the chat box. We will be looking at that throughout this session. Last but not least, you can show us some love or give us some reactions. Click on that reaction button on your toolbar. You'll also be able to change the skin tone for the reactions. Click on those three dots in the lower right corner. You'll see a thumbs up icon, click on that and that is how you can change your skin tone. If you'd like, feel free to give me a thumbs up or a heart. Makes me feel good. Thank you so much, everyone. Perfect. Let's get started. So our agenda for our workshop today will do a quick overview of accessibility based on quality matter standards. We'll also transition into the library and their resources. The Accessibility Resource Center, we have Robert here on the call, we'll go over the Accessibility Resource Center and those resources, and also next steps and Q&A at the very end. So let's get started. One of the missions for the CAL team here is a commitment to equitable and inclusive learning design. CAL is really committed to the use of universal design for learning, or UDL, and we offer weekly professional development topics such as this one on accessibility resources. We're always here to help you. I'll put our website and our email in the chat box. It's calhelpdesk at udc.edu. Feel free to go ahead, go ahead and send us an email and set a call up with us. We can also meet you in person, but we are always here to help and really just improve the design of your course. Now, just to begin, let's talk about why does accessibility matter, especially in our context here on the Cal team and with the library and the ARC. So accessibility in course design, it's inclusive and provides equal access to everyone, especially people with disabilities. It also promotes usability, it's the right thing to do, and it's the law. When you do design for everyone, it just makes a very inclusive learning environment, so all students will succeed. Next, how should you begin to think about accessibility, especially in terms of your courses? Plan your accessibility strategy to incorporate inclusive and equitable designs, taking into account the following areas, visual disabilities or auditory disabilities, even providing captions just like below right now that really helps with all learners and all participants, cognitive and motor disabilities, and English as a second language. And with that, I'd like to transition to Dominique Laws, who will talk more about quality matters standards. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Yes, so quality matters is <clears throat> a standard that we use um, here at the University of the District of Columbia to really make sure that we are incorporating the best practices of not only accessibility, but just building our courses in general. Um, Quality Matters has a wonderful guideline for making sure your course is accessible, and that uses the Quality Matters standard 8.1 through 8.6. We use this Quality Matters rubric in our peer reviews of all the courses that we review in Cal um, when we're working with faculty. So you can go to the next slide. So you want to make sure that when you are incorporating accessibility into your course, that you're making sure that your tables are organized and the data has appropriate table headers, that there's a hierarchy of material in the page documents, you're using specified heading one, two, et cetera, that the table content um, can be included to allow learners to move easily through the document, and that learners have access to the information on the accessibility of the learning management system, 
as well as additional required technology. So we can go to the next slide. So in terms of layout, it's really important that you think about how you style your content. You want to make sure that um, you have headings and body styles that are consistent, that you're using a font style and a font size that is um, inclusive for all of your students, that you um, stay away or avoid italicizing your text unnecessarily or underlining things that are not actually um, navigationally built, that all of your images and graphs have alt tags or descriptions or audio descriptions to help um, anyone who is visually impaired understand what it is that you're trying to convey with those images and graphs, and that you use uh, color coding and text specifically um, that will convey importance um, without uh, causing them to, to not be able to see the items. Um, so what we mean by that, I will show you in the next slide. So some examples of that include making sure that you, for example, in this particular screen, you can see that the, um, the header is uh, overview, it's, it's highlighted. And so when we use our backend review of uh, HTML, we can see that all of the headers are the same. Um, if you look to your uh, right of the screen where it's circled H4 overview, that lets me know that any place in this course, in this particular course, has that heading and all of those subsequent um, areas will be marked in that similar fashion. So we can go to the next slide, David. Similarly, when we look at alt text, we have this image of Gandhi here. And previously it had just said alt text Gandhi. But when we look at the image itself, it has a whole quote and then it has an image of Gandhi. So what we would want to do to make sure that it's inclusive and accessible for the student and conveys the information that we're looking to share is to incorporate image of Gandhi and then um, say the quote, which is se seven social sins, political uh, politics without principles, et cetera, et cetera. So that information would go into that area where it says alt, um, seen on the screen circled. Next slide. You also want to make sure that if you are incorporating videos into your um, course or into your shells that you are using closed caption whenever possible. The great thing about different um, elements that we use, such as Kaltura, um, YouTube, th they all have built-in closed captioning that you can turn on. Um, sometimes you will have to tweak your transcript if you are actively talking and you're allowing it to um, to uh, do the live closed caption as uh, even Zoom has that capability. And you can go back through and make sure that if anything is spelled incorrectly or if you um, talk too quickly and it's missed a word, you can incorporate that into the transcript. We always recommend that if you're using either audio or visual, that you always have a transcript for the learner so that they can follow along if they need to. Next slide. And my favorite part is the, the avoidance of using colored text. So, so many times we have um, the use of bright colors, blue, green, yellow, um, orange, red. And sometimes these, these um, particular colors can be difficult for people to see or navigate. Um, and so you want to basically avoid using any colored text other than blue or black to convey importance. If you are needing to convey importance, you can use that by using specific verbiage versus using specific coloring. And I think that that really helps to make sure that the students um, understand what is important in the class, but also allows them to differentiate between what it is that they need to focus on and what it is they don't. So next slide. 
Perfect. And thank you so much, Dominique. Dominique is such a wonderful resource here on the team. I will put her email in the chat box. It's dominique.laws at udc.edu. And thank you again, Dominique, for that. And sure. We'll and I would just, oh, yeah, go ahead. Can I add really quickly, David? Yeah. I will put in the chat a link to an accessibility color wheel that we in Cal use to make sure that colors are accessible when we're using um, anything that has to go on our website or anything that's visual that goes out to the public. So I will add that as well. Thank you. Excellent. That's perfect. And that's really helped us, um, especially with those clashing colors and just improving readability as well. And with that, thank you, Dominique. I would like to transition to Kathy Meals, our assessment librarian, and Trisha Clark, the community college engagement librarian, librarian, and they will also go over our library resources. Perfect, and I can see that on the screen. Go ahead. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Okay, there we go, full screen. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, so we are going to talk about what is available at um, UDC Library in terms of accessibility. Um, all right, so we have some accessible resources here, the first of which is an accessibility um, workstation here at Van Ness, which is located on the sixth floor of building 71. Um, at that workstation, there is uh, a wheelchair accessible desk. Um, and at that desk, we have a computer with various kinds of screen reader software, um, including job access with speech, otherwise known as JAWS. We also have magic, which is uh, a screen magnifier and screen reader software. And we also have open book. Um, at that desk, we have a low vision and large print keyboard. Uh, we have a digital scanner, which is sort of that interesting machine off to the right there in that image, the giant uh, interesting machine. And then we have a, a document viewer. We also have uh, hearing aid compatible uh, headsets for patrons um, with microphones, and those are available at our media desk um, for barring. Those are also located on the sixth floor of Building 71. When you come off the elevator, there's a desk right there, and you can stop off um, at that media desk and ask to borrow one of those headsets. Um, we will have a similar uh, set up at the Bernie Backus campus, the community college campus, once we have a space set up there. So in the meantime, um, our accessibility workstation is limited to the um, Venice campus, um, but we have a couple of other options for um, accessibility online as well. Um, as far as our website, we do try to maximize the uh, accessibility with things like headers, alt text, as um, Dominique mentioned, uh, on images. We also have captions on our YouTube videos, our YouTube tutorials that we do every semester. So please check those out. Um, and then we're also always seeking to pursue uh, universal design learning principles um, in our information literacy instruction and the materials that we give out during those sessions. On our website, um, we also have a resource guide for accessible teaching in higher education. Um, and I'm going to actually demo the site for you in just a bit, but there's some interesting things you can find on that um, page. Oop, went too far. Okay. Um, <clears throat> including understanding accessibility and disability. Um, we have information about teaching resources that are available. Um, that you can use uh, focusing on accessibility. We also have uh, information on local resources here at UDC, um, which will be discussed a little bit later. So let me actually just take you to our site. And here we are. All right, so on our site, you can see there is a great introductory um, space here that talks just a bit about um, why it's important to, to design for disability, understanding accessibility and disability. We also have some links on the left-hand side here, including teaching resources, um, a lot of great resources and materials for um, faculty who may be new to the concept or who may have had some experience in looking for additional resources and materials. We also have course materials linked at the bottom here on this page. Um, we have a link for further reading. 
um, some books that are available for borrowing. If you click through all of these, by the way, these are all in our database. So you can click through and request a book um, or material for pickup. We also have links to um, local resources here at UDC, including ARC, and of course, um, local resources um, in the city of um, District of Columbia. Um, and then we have additional websites here at the bottom that you can take a look at for further reading. All right, and now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Kathy. Let's get back to our PowerPoint. Great, I'm actually gonna, uh, well, yes, great, start here. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about accessibility of our electronic resources, which is uh, very important for people who are going to be using um, the library. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about what's built in. Um, and this is going to be big picture type stuff. There are lots of vendors who provide us with electronic resources and lots of different platforms. So for specifics, we can talk separately about the details and we'll share our contact information at the end. Um, but in general, um, these are the kinds of things that you're going to find. And what we're talking about here when we say electronic resources are scholarly article databases, ebooks, multimedia content. You, know, you may know the names of the database platforms, EBSCO, ProQuest, things like that stuff that folks will be using for their research or for class materials for students. So in general, um, our vendors are pretty good about having clear policies and statements uh, about their accessibility practices. Many of them have also been doing usability testing um, and have the results of those usability uh, tests on their websites. They also make sure that they are compliant with the web content accessibility guidelines, um, WCAG of the World Wide Web Consortium and Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, um, the federal law. Uh, common features that most of them have. I'll go over these and then I'll show you uh, what it looks like very quickly in just a minute. So most databases offer screen reader compatibility. Uh, they offer keyboard navigation, captions in alt text, um, captions for videos, alt text for photographs, uh, adjusting text size and contrast, and text-to-speech capabilities. So I just want to show you what example of what that looks like in one of our databases. Okay. So here we are on the main library website. All of our electronic resources are linked to from the A to Z resource list, which is right underneath the bar for UDC search. And I'll show you what this looks like in an EBSCO database called Academic Search Premier. So using the search bars at the top, I'll just do a quick search. Gentrification, Washington, DC, click the green search button. And I'll show you some of the accessibility tools in this first article in our search results. So in this article, um, over on the left sidebar, you can see that this article is available in HTML full text as well as PDF. The PDF should have accessibility features. Uh, not all of them do if they are scanned, um, but many of them do. So I'm going to scroll down past the abstract and other information on the page. And you'll see the HTML version of this article. You can listen to this. This will be the text to speech. Give it one more. So that's an example, and you can see the highlighting of the words that are being spoken. Um, you can also adjust uh, the timing, the pace of it. You can adjust um, these three sidebars on the right, um, language, changing the text. You can have a only text mode, which will allow you to expand the text, make it larger, uh, change the color contrast. Um, so perhaps you want uh, red on white instead, you can do all of those things. So this is just a sampling of some of the things you'll be able to do in um, the library uh, electronic resources. So I just want to do that quick overview to give you a sense of what's going on. Um, but as Trisha said, you know, we are committed to make sure that everybody is able to access and use 
our resources equitably. Um, so if you have any questions about specific things, specific materials that you want to use in your class or specific materials that you'd like your students to access for research, please contact us. We'll show our email address in just a minute. Patricia, I'm going to stop my share so you can go back to the contact us slide. Okay, and this will be a link to our website, udc.libguides.com, and the email address underneath that, ask at udc.libanswers.com, goes to all of the librarians and will respond to you as quickly as you can. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tricia and Kathy. That was very useful information. Um, so I will go ahead and hand it off to Robert Vela from the Rehabilitation, a uh, Rehabilitation Counselor at the Accessibility Resource Center. And Robert. And you're muted. Uh, just go ahead and unmute. Perfect. That always happens, good afternoon. Right? You're on good afternoon. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so if I can close this and start my. Okay, so uh, I represent the Accessibility Resource Center. I'm a rehabilitation counselor with ARC. Uh, we have uh, three counselors with ARC. Two of a two of our counselors are located at the Van Ness campus, and I work at the Bertie Backus campus. So before uh, any student with uh, Documented disability can receive accommodation services for courses that they are taking at the university or community college or the workforce program. They must be registered with our office. Uh, this is all our contact information. I have a PowerPoint. I'm going to quickly go through it because I normally like to use the website to show students and faculty um, how to apply for services. Um, Okay, let me see if I can minimize my face here. All right, so the Accessibility Resource Center uh, works to ensure that students with disabilities are afforded the opportunity to yield maximum benefit from their educational experiences at the University of the District of Columbia. Uh, we provide services and approve accommodation requests on an individualized basis. Uh, to all students have di who disclosed having a disability and provide medical documentation of such impairment. Let's see. So sometimes when I'm talking to faculty at the community college, I like to point out the differences between high school and college. So a lot of students who have disabilities uh, who came from the high school systems haven't really prepared themselves well for college. So it's real important for faculty and students to know that there's a shift in responsibility when they get to the college. And so this kind of highlights some of the uh, some of the differences and some of the standards that they they must meet when they're at college. Let's see. And uh, so confidentiality in high school, oftentimes students are labeled as a special education student. Uh, in college, students aren't labeled and they're not served separately from other students. So it's a student's responsibility to apply for our services. Um, in high school, sometimes uh, school personnel talk freely about a student's disability. In uh, college and at the university, all of the information that's discussed with ARC is confidential. So unless a student has re signed a release form for us to discuss with their instructors or tutors or anyone else involved in the services that they're receiving, their information is kept confidential with our office. Okay, so documentation. Students are responsible for obtaining appropriate documentation of their disability from a qualified pr professional. Uh, once in college, if students suspect that they have a disability, but do not have the appropriate documentation, the student is responsible for seeking an evaluation and paying for that evaluation. Okay, so who is a qualified professional? This depends on the type of disability, for medical conditions, a medical doctor, for psychiatric conditions, a psychiatrist, therapist, psychologist, or social worker. For learning disabilities, a psychoeducational evaluation from a school psychologist 
or clinical neuropsychologists. These are some various types of disabilities and how to register for ARC services. So David, I'm going to, you said I have to hit the share button again to do my. Yes, so okay. uh, once you stop sharing this, um, just reshare your uh, browser. Perfect, Great. I see it. You see it? Okay, yeah, perfect. Thanks. Okay, so let me go back to our main website. Oh. I keep getting all these pop-ups, sorry y'all. All right. Okay, so this is this is our website. And what I like to tell students and um, staff is that we have our intake forms here where they can download and fill them out. They're fillable PDF documents. There are three forms that they need to fill out in order to be receiving services from ARC. Along with these three forms, which I'll open up really quickly, one is a registration form. It's simply the student telling us who they are, what they're classified as, what they're studying, and what their disability is. The most important part here for us is having them describe the academic implications of their disability and what kind of accommodations they're requesting. Sometimes students have a very good idea of what this means. Sometimes they do not. Um, we ask them to fill this out to the best of their ability. And the other two forms are the release of information form that I mentioned earlier to be able to discuss confidential information about their condition or services needed. And then the other form is also a confidentiality form that they sign. When they turn those documents into our office, they do so along with documentation of their disability. We create a file for them. And our assistant, our project assistant, Rhonda Brown is responsible, responsible for putting those files together and then assigning those cases to us. Uh, some of us deal directly with students as well. Um, the reason that I would that I wanted to show the website is because we will be updating this. We will be hopefully going uh, live with a new case management system that we have where these forms will no longer be used. We'll have an online system that faculty and students can access directly through our website. And, uh, and so that should make it quicker and more efficient. Was just on that. Let's see what else do I want to. So our website's a little busy. We've been trying to clean it up and fix it. Uh, it's getting better. Uh, right here, we have a list of some of the ARC services. We do have uh, services that uh, that are offered for adaptive assistive technology. Uh, we have interpreting services. We refer over to the tutoring lab and to the library and of course Cal. And uh, we have note-taking support and uh, we provide testing accommodations for students that need them as well. We also have some additional resources that we've provided links to different applications that will help students. They're all free applications. Uh, oops, that's not the page I wanted. And we have a variety of, of applications that a student can look into and they're based on different needs. So this, these apps here are related to reading and literacy support. We have some related to writing, note-taking, speech to text, brainstorming, and study skills and aids. 
So these are all free, free tools that a student can look into and research or talk over with Cal um, library or the rehab counselor. Now, the new resource that we've been uh, promoting, I know I have encouraged all my students to use it. Sorry, I'm only seeing like part of my screen, so I keep clicking on the same thing. Sorry about that. So we have this semester, we had access to Kurzweil 3000. And Kurzweil 3000 is a text-to-speech text -text software that uh, comes in very useful to our students. And the great thing about it is that we all have access to it. So uh, faculty, staff, students can use their sign-on login that they use for UDC uh, to log into the system. Uh, you're able to enable it when you're working on the web to have it read to you. If you download documents or assignments from your coursework, the same thing. Uh, so that's been a very useful tool. I've been getting good feedback from a lot of my students who are using it. And I think a lot of people still don't know that it's out there. So I recommend that you uh, share the news about this very useful tool. And let's see. I think I kind of went really quickly. Uh, I really want people to become more familiar with our website because our website currently has the process for applying for our services. Like I said, probably towards the end of this year, beginning of the new year, we'll have a new uh, online case management system called AIM, and people will be directly inputting information into that once they, once they log in. Uh, so that will be very helpful. Uh, another, um, let's see, what else did I want to, well, I talked about confidentiality. Uh, one of the things that we talked about before we started the presentation is that I normally tell faculty, a lot of times faculty are going to be the first ones to, to recognize that a student may be qualifies for our services and is not registered with us. And so because of confidentiality, what I ask if a professor knows that they have a student that they're recommending and they've spoke to the student, uh, you can send me the name of the student and the number of the student email and I will reach out to them. Um, at Bertie Backus, I work there on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. The usual practice is that someone usually walks a student over to my office, and that's a good way to refer someone. But on email, uh, a lot of times people will, you know, call and, and want to know, did the student re register? Did the student register? And due to confidentiality, uh, I'm not able to, like, discuss uh, those issues with a faculty member or staff member, unless a student has already done paperwork with us and released me to be able to talk about their, their case. Um, I'm going to look at, that's kind of the, the bulk of what I wanted to talk about in terms of ARC. I do know that one of our counselors was potentially sitting in on this, and I asked her to like share any information if she felt that I didn't capture something and that she was welcome to 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 say something um and dr brown it looks like are you asking where we're located with arc so arc is located in building 39 uh we are on the first floor we recently moved to the corner office suite um uh, but we're on the first floor at, on building 39 and there's a suite of offices there. Like I said, Rhonda Bowman is our project assistant, and that's where you'll find the other two counselors, Pamela Butler and Clayton McLaughlin. I'm located at uh, the Bertie Backus campus at the community college. And like I said, I work there in person on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, our hours there are nine to five. I'm very reachable by phone and email and, uh, Yes, you're, of course, you're welcome. Um, let's see if I could think of anything. I kind of, I was just trying to give a quick overview. Of course, our website has tons of information. We've tried to streamline it as much as we could, but people often have a lot of questions. And sometimes for those students and their parents, we have tons of information. It can get very detailed. 
Uh, the one thing I would say is that a uh, student can have, two students can have the same disability, but everything's on an individual basis. So one student may have different needs than another. Uh, possibly the other thing that I didn't discuss is once they do re register with us, they will receive an accommodation letter. That accommodation letter will be given to the student uh, and the student is responsible for sharing that letter with their instructors. Um, sometimes for, I do have maybe a handful of students that uh, need me to send that letter on their behalf to instructors. We sent, most of us send our accommodation letters through Microsoft Forms, which makes it easier for the faculty member to receive then they sign and date it, and we get acknowledgement that they've read the accommodation letter and that they know the services that the student would need. Um, one thing that I'll say before I turn it back to you, David, is that probably the biggest questions, I think that's part of why we're doing this, is the biggest question I get from faculty uh, is how, how do I do extended time on Blackboard or how do I enable captions on Blackboard? So we've been working with Cal. Cal provides consultation for faculty who need training on how to make their courses more accessible. And uh, there's a nice handout. I think it needs to be updated that ARC has, um, but we got the original handout from Cal. I definitely recommend that faculty make uh, appointments with Cal to learn how to make their online classes and in-person classes more accessible to our students. It's about all I have, unless anyone has like specific questions for me. I was just gonna jump in. Uh, Robert did a great job. My name is Pamela Butler. I'm at the Van Ness campus. I just wanted you all to put a face to the name. Myself and Mr. McLaughlin are here at the Van Ness campus, building 39, room 106B. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Excellent, thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Robert. That was wonderful. Um, it's really been a pleasure for me to work with everyone here on the call, uh, really just to go over the resources. So again, I do want to share uh, some of the emails uh, from today. So we have ask at udc.libanswers.com. We also have arc at udc.edu and calhelpdesk at udc.edu. Uh, we would be more than happy, whichever email that you email, uh, we can go ahead and point you to those resources. Uh, before we conclude, I do want to put some of our links in the chat. Our first one, we do have Cal office hours offered weekly, as well as other professional development opportunities, which I'll go over in a moment, and our Cal YouTube channel. This and other webinars are all hosted on our YouTube channel. Feel free to watch those. I will upload those shortly after this webinar is over. And just to go over some of the upcoming sessions this week, we have two. So we do have one on Thursday about the WebEx updates that have been rolled out. I will also be speaking shortly a little bit on accessibility within WebEx as well, some of those features. And we do have a library webinar on the 18th, which is Will It Blend Selecting and Evaluating Sources with Megan Kowalski as well as Trisha Clark. Uh, and that will be on Friday, November 18th from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, any questions that we can answer before we conclude today? But again, thank you so much everyone for joining us on this call today. Uh, we do appreciate your time and we hope that we can see you very soon. So have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.